Good morning. It's great to see all of you here this morning. Good to be back. Uh, it, since the last time I was with you, uh, we had a changing of the season, so it is now fall, um, or as we know it in Texas, summer with pumpkins. So uh, happy fall to you. Uh, last week, uh, me and five other members of our church were in England. We worshiped uh, in a little, two little churches in uh, Consett, England. There's another mission team from our church that was in Costa Rica. Now we're all back home, and it's good. Uh, I've written something about our trip to England. You might find that online if, you, if you're my Facebook friend or if you follow my blog. Uh, I'll share some more details on Wednesday night. But it was a wonderful time. First of all, we were out in the countryside of England, north uh, County Durham, if you know England at all. Uh, this is the part of the country that we were told tourists don't visit, but they should because it's beautiful. Rolling green hills dotted with sheep. I mean, it's just picturesque as can be. We had great weather while we were there. Usually, apparently, it's very cold and rainy in England this time of year, but it was picture perfect. We had several people say, thanks for bringing your weather to us from Texas, and we're like, it's only this way like five days a year in Texas, but uh, we wish we could have brought it back with us. Uh, the people there were wonderful. And these two churches that we visited, the people were so loving, so kind, so committed to the Lord. We just fell in love with them. Wish we could have brought them with us. If, if any of them are listening right now or watching or streaming, I, I miss you already. Um, but the, the little village of Consett up there, uh, these two churches are, are serving in a part of the world. This is where our spiritual heritage is. I, as a Baptist, especially because Baptists came from England. That's where our denomination originated. And then you, you can just roll down the list of people, uh, great men and women of faith who've influenced us. They were all from England. So many of them were. And yet now it's a country where there's such a spiritual state of dryness, where few people go to church. I think the, the number is 11% of, of British people go to church at least once a month, 11%. And the most, most people in that culture have no knowledge of spiritual things, have no interest in spiritual things. Sunday is just another day for them. And so these churches recognize if we're going to keep going, I mean, one of the two churches we work with was founded in 1652. And they've recognized we can't just sit here in our buildings and wait for the people to come to us because they're not. We have to go to them. And that's something we as American Christians need to recognize too. So all, all weekend we worked with them and, and we helped them. We worshiped with them last Sunday. It was wonderful. It reminded me of the size of God's kingdom. It also reminded me how great heaven's going to be. I sure hope I get to see those people again in this world. But if not, I'll get to worship with them in the next world. Sunday evening, we got the two churches together, and we did a communion service, and that was just such a rich time. We just, just felt the love in that room, even though we'd only known these people a few days. And we had some of the best conversations you can imagine, uh, some, some conversations that just showed us God had been planning this. God had been setting this moment aside for us to meet this person and this person and this person, and we just know He's going to do great things through those in days ahead. So thanks for praying for us. We're going to get to serve or, or, or share communion together today here as a congregation too. Uh, we do that here at First Baptist once a quarter. So today we're going to do the Lord's Supper, and if you're not a member of First Baptist Church, you are welcome to, to take the Lord's Supper with us. The only thing the Scriptures tell us is don't take it in an unworthy fashion. It specifically says... If someone is holding something against you, if your heart is not right with the Lord, if you're holding something against Him or back from Him, you need to get that right with Him. If you know that there's someone you need to apologize to or, or someone who holds something against you, you need to contact them and, and get things right. Do what you can to make things right with that person. Don't take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. But first, we're going to take a look at Galatians 6, verses 1 through 3. Galatians 6, 1 through 3. So if you'll turn there in your Bibles, that's where we'll be today. We're continuing this series on the one and others in Scripture. And, and I, I just want to begin by saying something I've learned, and maybe you've seen this too, that sometimes the thing you need most in life, the thing that's going to make your life better, the thing that is exactly what you need is something you weren't looking for at all, something that wasn't even on your shopping list. So an example, did you know that if you got one more hour of sleep a night, it would make you happier than if you made $60,000 more a year? 
This is true. This is scientifically verified. I don't know how they figured this out, but they did. It, it makes you happier to get enough sleep. Not only that, it helps you perform better. I, I read so many articles that say if you get more sleep, you, you, you feel better, you're healthier, your relationships are stronger, you perform better at work, you, you make better decisions. Basically, everything in life gets better when you get more sleep. One personal trainer put it this way, the greatest performance enhancing substance on earth is not a supplement you can buy, it's not a drug you can get under the table, it's sleep. So all you got to do is just go to bed an hour earlier. And this is something we all know, but none of us do it. And, and let me just say, I hope you do, but not in the next 30 minutes, okay? Hold on for me. There'll be time to sleep. Late. Sleep on your own dang time, okay? Um, secondly, here's another example, and here's where we're going to be today. We have this idea that true happiness is to be totally self-sufficient, to have so much stuff, to have so much financial security. You don't need anybody. You think about somebody like Elon Musk. Many of you probably know who that is. Uh, he, he's a man who's started four different companies that have earned over a billion dollars, four different ones, probably not any older than I am. Um, his personal net worth is $22 billion. He's a guy who does cameo roles in movies and dates supermodels and movie stars. People look at him and say, look at this guy. He's got everything he wants. He doesn't ever have to do any work he doesn't want to do. He doesn't ever have to work with anyone he doesn't want to work with. I mean, isn't that the great life where you can be totally self-sufficient, call your own shots, you don't need anybody, you don't need to do anything? And yet, he was interviewed recently in Rolling Stone magazine, and he said, and I quote, being in a big empty house, no footsteps echoing through the hallways, how do you make yourself happy in a situation like that? And before you stop and say, oh, you poor, spoiled multi-billionaire, Please consider that the Surgeon General of our own country has recently said that loneliness is the number one public health problem in America today. Not heart disease, not cancer, not AIDS, not, uh, not opioid addiction, but loneliness. It affects over half of the adults in our country. It's worse for you physically than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's worse for you than obesity. Than obesity. Yes, it really is true. You'll live longer if you're fat with friends than if you're fit with no friends. And all of us know this. All of us see this. And yet, we have this idea that what I really need is to get away from people, to have my own way, and it's the worst possible thing for us. And that's what our scripture is about today. It says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. One of the things you notice when you read the New Testament for the first time, if you read it all the way through, for the first time, and I hope you're doing that with us as we read the entire Bible this year, Christianity is more than just an individual religion. See, growing up, that's what was preached to us. If you grew up in an evangelical environment, you heard over and over again, accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and you'll go to heaven when you die. Come to know Jesus, and you'll be saved. We use a lot of language. It isn't really biblical language, personal Lord and Savior, things like that. Now, it really is true that Jesus saves individual people. You can be saved without being a member of a church. It really is true that if you believe in Him and trust in what He did for you at the cross, you will experience eternal life. But that's not really the point. When you read the New Testament, it's obvious. God's not just trying to pluck individual people out of the world and bring them to heaven. He's trying to form a new race of people. See, right now we've got all these different categories of humans, and God's trying to make a whole new category. Men and women who are rescued by the cross, by the blood of the cross, who form a new kind of people, people who live in a way that nobody's ever lived before. So that's why in the New Testament, 59 different times, the words one another are mentioned, because God cares intensely about the relationships we have with one another. And two weeks ago, we looked at how we're to love one another. Last week, Alan shared about how we need to forgive each other. And hopefully this past week, some of you have extended forgiveness to someone you never forgave before. But today, we're going to look at what it means to bear one another's burdens. 
Again, we think the good life is to be totally self-sufficient and need nobody else. Whereas the Bible says, no, not only do you need other people, you need to borrow their burdens so you can have the life you were meant to live. So together you can become the people of God that God created us to be. How do we obey this? Three things. Number one, look for someone who needs help. Look for someone who needs help. In other words, don't wait for people to ask you for help. Go out looking for people who need help. Now, I've lived in Texas virtually my entire life, and really it's the only place I ever want to live. I love traveling. I love visiting other parts of the world, but in the end, I always want to come back here. In fact, if there's a new Conroe in the new earth, that's where I want my mansion to be. I really do. I love Texas. I love football. I love the food. I love the people. I even sometimes like the weather, especially during the winter when they're shoveling snow. And I'm like, I've never done that. I love Texas, but there are some funky things about living here. For instance, when I was in England last week, I didn't see one pickup truck, not one. Not a single one. You come to Texas and everybody drives pickup trucks. It doesn't make any sense. You're going down the road and you see a guy in this big half-ton monstrosity and you think, oh, well, that's some rancher who's, you know, getting ready to pull his cattle to the market or whatever. No, that's some bald-headed IT guy who looks like, thinks he's the Marlboro man when he's behind the wheel of his F-250. And we just, we have this obsession with trucks and it doesn't make sense. I've owned two trucks in my life. I know what it means. It, they handle poorly. Uh, you get terrible gas mileage. They're a nightmare to park. But the worst thing about driving a pickup is when you drive a pickup, people always ask you to help them move, right? <laughs> you ever notice this? You're driving a pickup and total strangers walk up and say, nice truck, what you doing Saturday? And the problem with helping people move, it's the worst. It's, it's the worst favor people ask of you. It's even worse than, hey, come over, I'm going to tell you about my multi-level marketing opportunity, and that's pretty bad. But when they say, come help me move, you know what that means. That means you're losing your day off that week. It's shot. It means that you're scraping all the skin off your knuckles, right? You're worthless for several days and you get nothing in return. It means that that person's stuff becomes your problem. Some of you read the article in your At First Guide today about how we have a, a piano in our house, and we've had it since we were married 27 years ago. I mean, we didn't have anything, but we had an upright piano, and we've moved to that piano several times. So whenever I ask someone to help me move, it's like that piano becomes their problem. You bear someone's burdens. And that's what we're called to do. And in a similar way, when you bear someone's emotional burdens, it becomes your problem. They've lost a loved one, and you come to sit with them as they grieve. They're walking through a difficult divorce. Is there another kind, really? They, they're experiencing a, a loss in their own life. Maybe, maybe their child moves away from home, and they're just not ready for that. Or, or maybe uh, there's some relationship struggles. And you take on their burdens. You sit with them. You weep with them. You intercede with them in prayer. Their problems become your problems. Do you know that's probably emotionally the hardest part of being a pastor or any kind of minister is you feel like you're carrying the emotional weight of an entire congregation. And that's why pastors burn out, really, frankly. It's not that we work more hours than y'all. It's, it's not that our jobs are, are harder or more stressful. It's that there's an emotional burden that just isn't there in a lot of jobs. And actually, it wasn't meant to be that way. I'm privileged as a pastor to pray with you and to enter into your suffering, but we should all be carrying that load. When we bear each other's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. You may say, well, but if you're borrowing somebody else's trouble, I've got enough trouble of my own. Why would I do that? See, in Paul's day, the very, very popular way of thinking was called stoicism, to be stoic. We use that as an adjective to mean someone who's just not very emotional. But in, the, in, in Paul's day in the ancient world, it was an actual philosophy of life. You were either a stoic or you were an epicurean. If you were a stoic... You thought the whole point of life was to become totally self-contained. And that meant you never asked anyone for help. Never. Because you wanted to rise above your troubles. And asking for help meant you were giving in. And you never helped anybody else because you didn't want to deprive them of the opportunity to grow in their stoicism. But along comes this Christian movement and it's totally different. And, and whether you're a slave 
or, or a businessman, whether you're a, a, a housewife or a soldier. You come into the house of God and you just lay yourself bare and you say, here's what I'm struggling with. How can y'all help? And it was a place where rich people, the few rich people that existed in the early church, would literally take whatever they didn't need to survive and give it to the church. You know, Barnabas, among many, was famous for finding a piece of land that he had, that had been in his family for generations and saying, I don't need this to survive. I'm going to sell it so I can give it to the church so they can have more resources to bear the burdens of the church members. Do you see what just happened there? The problems of less fortunate people became Barnabas's problem. He was sharing their burden. And that's what we're called to do. That is our calling as the people of God. In fact, Jesus in Luke 14 gave some very interesting instructions. A lot of things Jesus said that would not be popular if he were saying them today. One of them was when you throw a big dinner party, don't follow your instincts. Your instincts are, let me invite this guy because um, he runs a business and he might be able to hire me someday. Let me invite this couple because they're really popular and I want to get into their network of friends. Let me invite these people because they're attractive. Let me invite these people because they're funny. No, he said, no, invite the people no one else wants at the party. What kind of logic is that? Why would I invite a bunch of people who can't do anything for me? Well, here's why. Luke 14, verse 15, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. See, there's all these people in this world, most of us, who live in a certain way that is, I'm going to get what's mine. That's the whole point of life is to get what's mine and to, to be out there for me and, and to take on as little trouble and responsibility as I can. And then there's those few people who borrow the troubles of others, who say, I'll help you bear that burden. And there's coming a day when a new world will begin, a world that will never end, and we'll look at those people, those select few people who just bore burdens, bore burdens all the time, and we'll say, man, that's the guy who knew how to live. I wish I would have lived like him. So look for people who need help. Number two, pick up those who have fallen. Paul begins the passage by saying, if anyone is caught in any transgression, it's an interesting verb he uses there. He doesn't say, if anybody makes bad decisions. He doesn't say, if anybody disgraces themselves. If anybody sins, he says, if anybody is caught in a transgression. It's sort of like the verb you would use for when a fly gets caught in a spider web. And he's not, in saying that, Paul is not excusing us and saying, well, you can't help it when you make a mistake, when you commit a sin, it's not your fault. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, if one of us ruins our lives by making a terrible choice, you cheat on your spouse, you ruin your marriage, you don't deal with a bad character flaw like temper or, 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 critis, or a critical manner, and you end up driving away one of your children, uh, you... You, you lose your self-control and you say things that get you fired at work. If, if in some way your bad choices come back to haunt you and, and destroy you in some way, Paul wants us to understand when people experience that, although yes, they're responsible, we should not, we should not pile on them. We should see them as, as people who were caught, caught in the web of the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's not where they wanted to be. They're experiencing their worst nightmare. So the, the job of us as Christians, particularly, he says, those who are spiritual. What does that mean, spiritual? It means people who have walked with the Holy Spirit long enough that they're mature, that they know what it means to follow Christ. In other words, if you're really spiritual and you see somebody stumble, somebody fall, your first instinct should not be to say, look there, everybody, don't do what this person did. Your first instinct shouldn't be to kick them out of the church and disassociate yourself so you can say, listen, we don't, we don't agree with what he did. Your first instinct should be to restore them gently. That word restore is a very interesting verb because it's the same Greek verb you would use for setting a broken bone. Or even more appropriately, it's the same Greek verb that the gospel writers use to talk about the apostles mending their fishing nets at the end of a, night of, a long night of fishing. So think about that for a moment. Jesus said he came to make us fishers of men. In other words, our whole calling is that we would live lives that are so different from the rest of the world, so full of grace, so full of mercy, so full of love and humility, 
that we would draw people one by one into His kingdom, into His family. But when you stumble, when you're caught in transgression, it's like your nets are torn. The world looks at you and says, why would I believe in your Savior? You don't live any different than I do. And when that happens, you and I should come alongside and gently restore. In other words, build them back up until they're back to the point where they're attractive to unbelievers, where they draw people to Christ again. And Paul says, keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. And I used to read that and think what he meant was, hey, if you're ministering to drunks, watch out so you don't start drinking too. Watch out when you're ministering to people who are promiscuous so you don't start sleeping around like they do. That's not what he's saying, actually. Paul, you remember, before he got saved, he was a Pharisee. He was a legalist. And what he's saying is, when you help restore people, guard your own heart because you'll have a tendency to say, you know, I never stumbled like he did. I guess I'm just a better person. You have a tendency to become judgmental, to become hateful. Guard your heart lest you to be tempted by the same sin that destroyed the Pharisees and scribes. Now, let's be honest. That kind of behavior is not what we as Christians are known for, is it? In fact, it's been said over and over again, the Christian church is the only army that shoots its own wounded. And that's a good soundbite, but it's not actually true. We're not the only ones. Actually, all humanity is like this. Watch the news next time a politician stumbles and into scandal and loses his position, or next time uh, a famous business person has to declare bankruptcy, or uh, the next time an athlete, a, a well-known athlete, blows it in the big game. We, we love to jump on that. We love to make fun of that. We, we love to chop down our heroes and watch them burn. When I was a kid, I was in 4-H, so every year I raised a different animal to show it at the, at the livestock show. And I didn't really love that. I'm glad I ended up doing it. I ended up buying my first car with the money I earned from all those animals. But every year it's like, okay, I guess i got to do this again. One year I had this brilliant plan. I was going to raise chickens because chickens are easy. You don't walk a chicken, right? You just throw some feet at it and you walk away. And I raised chickens that year. Actually, I actually won a grand prize, grand champion with my chickens, but I never raised chickens again. You know why? Because chickens are the meanest animals on the face of the earth. And you look at them, and you're like, oh, they're so cute and fluffy. If a chicken has some kind of a wound, the other chickens will peck her to death. That's what chickens are like. And that's what humans are like. We love to pounce on weakness. But God's people have to be different. And if your instinct, search your heart, be honest with yourself. If your instinct, when you see someone fall, if your first instinct is to, is to feel superior, to rejoice a little bit, then pray and ask God to change your heart. And that brings us to our third point. Fulfill the law of Christ. I said at the beginning, this teaching is the cure for loneliness and friendlessness, and that's because when you become the kind of person who bears the burdens of others, who consistently lifts up those who fall, you'll never lack for friends, because there's always people around who need your help. Now, they may not be the bright, shiny, super popular, super rich friends that you've been craving, but they will be true friends. And Paul says, when you do this, you actually fulfill the law of Christ which is an interesting phrase because it's never used anywhere else in the Bible. And it's particularly ironic in the context of Galatians because if you read Galatians, one of the things you know is Paul wrote Galatians to say, just following rules does not make you a Christian. Just living by the law that you find in the Bible does not make you pleasing to God. There's more to it than that. And yet here, in this very anti-legalistic book of the Bible, he says, fulfill the law of Christ. Why does he say that? Why does he use that specific term? I think it's because of Isaiah 53. And some of you know Isaiah 53, this chapter of the Bible, one of my favorite in the whole book, written 700 years before Jesus. It sounds like it's written by an eyewitness of the crucifixion itself. It's written to say, hundreds of years from now, there will be a Messiah, and this is what he will do for us. Let me read you verses 3 through 5. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. 
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. And what that reminds us is the law of Jesus, the Jesus law is to bear the burdens of others. Because on that day, that Friday morning, 2,000 years ago, in downtown Jerusalem, when that, that Nazarene carpenter took on his lacerated shoulders this rough, rugged crossbeam of wood, he was bearing our burden. His sin didn't put him on that cross. Mine did. He was borrowing our trouble. He was making it his own. And he didn't just share our burdens. He bore them. He carried our burdens to the cross and nailed them there. And they're still there if you have, grace, if you have wisdom enough to receive it. And that means that if you really want to be like Jesus, if you really want to live a life that's outstanding, you're never more like Jesus than when you help someone who's hurting. You're never more like Jesus than when you come alongside somebody who has messed up his life royally, who the rest of your Christian friends have written off, and you say, I'm going to be there for you, and I'm going to get you back on your feet. I believe in you because Jesus believes in you. So you can go to church every Sunday. I hope you do. You can do your best to live by the laws in this book. I hope you do. You'll live better for it. But you're not really like Jesus until you become a burden bearer. And so, I want to challenge you to pray to God and pray something like this in just a moment. Lord, I'm just not compassionate enough. Basically, my life is all about myself. I like to feel superior to others. I like to avoid getting entangled in the affairs of other people. I've got enough problems of my own, so I try to avoid responsibility. I'm just lazy and distracted and selfish, but I want to be more like you. So change my heart. Show me somebody this week whose burdens I can bear. Teach me compassion. Help me to look on people the way you do. Make me a joyful, compassionate burden bearer just like you. Can you pray something like that? Would you dare to give God permission to change your life in that way? See, it's the last thing you think you need. Bringing the problems of other people into your life? No. But it's actually the thing that can set you free. It's actually the thing that brings your life joy and meaning. Would you call on God to make you a joyful burden bearer?